Welcome everyone to the Campus Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host Derek Christians and on this episode of the podcast I am here sitting with some students from State University of New York, Cobalt Skill. There's three of them here. If you guys are new to the Campus Waterfowl Podcast, welcome. Campus Waterfowl Podcast and what Campus Waterfowl is all about is going around the country, highlighting collegiate waterfowl students and what they're doing in terms of uh, out there in the field hunting, uh, but then also research. So anything to do with the collegiate audience pertaining to waterfowl or wetlands, uh, we're pretty much covering everything what they're doing. On this podcast, we'll be talking a little bit about their involvement with the Ducks Unlimited chapter that they have going on at their college, and then also probably a little bit about this weekend, what we're all doing, uh, what it's like hunting the areas, um, and then probably a little bit of what it's like hunting in New York in general, I think would be interesting to, to talk about. Uh, but another topic we'll be also talking about is R3, which stands for Recruit, Retain, and Reactivate. So it's an, initi- it's an in- initiative for the outdoor industry which we'll be touching about and i want to hear your guys' thoughts my guests thoughts on this initiative but first off before we get into the podcast i want to let you know that if you guys are listening to the podcast on apple podcast spotify that you can also see us in video right now we're recording this podcast uh at louis is it your your family's duck camp here yeah very nice so uh very duck camp looking so you guys be sure to check out the video and if you guys are watching the video thank you for tuning in to our youtube channel um if you can't finish the the episode be sure to take it on the road uh and listen to it on apple podcast spotify and all those streaming platforms a little more housekeeping things i uh, gotta thank kent cartridge for sponsoring this season's collegiate waterfowl tour they're supplying the ammo for the students this hunting season so uh, be sure to look be on the lookout for their ammo at your local retailers uh they got their Kent Fast Steel 2.0, but then they actually just rolled out a new ammo this year called Fast Steel Plus, which is a stacked load, um, and we've been shooting the two the 2.4 stacked uh, this season so far, so be, be on the lookout for that, and then also got to thank Benelli for sponsoring this, this year's tour as well. Uh, they uh, are letting us shoot some of their M2s this year, um, so students get to try those out out here hunting some ducks so we'll get to get their thoughts on on those throughout the season um and uh have them be able to to shoot those as well so uh thank you benelli for sponsoring this tour all right i think you guys good i'm ready ready to go all right let's get into this conversation uh let's start out with some introductions louis you want (laughs) to start out just uh introduce yourself maybe a little bit about yourself and then uh, what you're doing at suny cobalt skill uh, my name is Louis Hassenjager. I'm a second year wildlife management major at Cobal Skill. Uh, I'm from the Finger Lakes region in New York, and I went to Cobal Skill because it really drew to me as it's a very hands on opportunity in the wildlife field. A lot of our classes are very hands on lab out in the field applying like actual techniques used by wildlife management ma- managers and biologists. Uh, I'm Ethan Kuchenberger. I'm a uh, first-year student here at Cobalt Skill. I'm studying cybersecurity, so I'm a little different than everybody else at Cobalt Skill for the most part. And I'm minoring in precision agriculture. Um, I mean, it's really different, but at the same time, I have the same goals as these guys. I like to be out in the woods, and I'm hoping that this will give me this career will give me the ability to be out there. Um, I'm only about f- uh, 45 minutes in the area of Cobalt Skill, is where I grew up, the central New York. So I'm glad to be out at the Finger Lakes right now. It's a, definitely a different different breed than what I'm used to. So it's just excited to be out here. Yeah, my name is Maddox Sturk. Uh, I'm a second year student at Cobalt Skill in the wildlife management major as well. Um, I'm from Western New York. I'm about four hour drive from Cobalt Skill, um, right up on Lake Ontario. We do a lot of hunting out there. Um, but I mean, Louis. Louie and Ethan kind of said it best. It's Cobalt Skill is kind of the place to be in New York if you're really into wildlife and you want to make a career in it. Um, it's You can't beat their classes and all their hands-on opportunities and stuff. It's just can't speak highly enough about, about the university, really. Very nice. Great advertising for the, for the college there. Yes. Good job. <laughs> um, so one thing uh, I always like asking students kind of first to start, start off the conversation is um, I'm here to – kind of highlight you guys in whatever you guys are hunting this weekend. So whether it's ducks or geese or um, going after divers or just whatever. Um, But 
everyone's stories of how they got into this is sometimes is different. Everyone is on a different timeline of how long they've been hunting. So would you guys mind sharing just how you guys got into waterfowl hunting? Uh, yeah, so I guess I can start. So I first started wild, waterfowl hunting my freshman year of high school. One of my buddies, uh, his family owns a farm, and he invited me on a youth hunt for some geese with some guys on the farm that uh, were pretty into it and knew what they were doing. And I went on that hunt got hooked into it and then every year after I kind of started picking it up more and more but because of sports uh, in the fall for school I really didn't have time to hunt and I was doing two different sports at the same time so there's like no time on weekends or after school and then when COVID hit uh, New York State didn't have sports the entire fall of the 2020 year so I filled my time with hunting deer wasn't really open to start so I got into early goose season in New York And then every year since then, so it's only my third year of waterfowl hunting, really, full on. But every year I get more and more into it, figure out more and more stuff, learn different tricks and trades, and perfect it. And then also learn more about the birds themselves, what actually they do, not what just other people say. I'd consider this my first year of serious waterfowl hunting. Um, Why originally, so my dad's a big hunter, but he doesn't hunt waterfowl. And so we owned some property with some swamp on it that I'd always seen ducks on when I was hunting deer or turkey or anything for that matter. And so I was kind of always interested in it. And so basically like my first year, which would be my junior year in high school, I would like take a kayak out, no decoys, like it was this bright orange kayak. And I just put my shotgun in there, just paddle down, try and jump ducks see what I could get. I don't even think I ever killed a duck doing that. And then this past year, I started I started out with some goose hunting. Um, it was real shabby, like just layout blinds with no cover on them, maybe 12 full bodies trying to hunt like a 300-bird feed. And after that, I started getting duck hunting a little bit more. Went out with some buddies I met through school and everything. But uh, it was kind of short-limited because of sports and everything going on in high school. And then since I've come to Cobble Skill, this is my first like waterfowl season where I'm really spending the time, really putting the hours in, whether it be scouting and the money for that matter. You know, I've uh, bought a lot of decoys in the past little bit of time and um, starting to invest in some nicer equipment and starting to get on some birds finally. So it's it's definitely getting more hooked by the day. Yeah, so I I have a little bit of different background than these two. I, I was lucky enough to be born into a big hunting family and waterfowl was definitely included. My, um, my dad was really big into waterfowl for a long time. Uh, he's, he's, he's phasing out of it a little bit now. He finds it a little easier to, uh, set up for deer and hunt the deer stand a little bit, but, um, he actually used to be a guide in upstate New York for waterfowl for a short period of time. Um, but I learned everything I know from him. Um, and so I, I've been really into it from as early as I could hunt. I just, I, went on my first couple of duck hunts and whether it was hunting the swamps or hunting cornfields, it was just, it, it instantly, you know, caught my attention. You know, it's, it's nice sitting in a deer stand. It's nice, you know, calling turkeys in the woods, but there's really nothing like the, the adrenaline when you're, when you're out there waterfowl hunting. And so it's just, it's, it's definitely a passion of mine. Um, and I've just kind of stuck with it ever since I get more and more in it every year. And you, you know, you learn, you learn from the birds, you learn from the different people you hunt with. I'm lucky enough to obviously have met these two and hunting different parts of New York and learning all the different uh, methods and tactics that other people have. And you kind of, you hold that all in your arsenal and you can really find all the different methods to attack these birds. And it's, um, it's really cool. Um, so I, I, yeah, that's, that's basically all I have to say on that. Were you guys, uh, Ethan and Louie, were you guys first generation kind of like waterfowl hunters in your family do you th- you can go first I can, I can go ahead so basically like when i first wanted to try out waterfowl hunting and it was it was based off of uh i started off like I, i'm a big turkey hunter in my area there's there's a lot of good turkey population so it's a big thing and so just like that one on connection you know you're trying to convince that bird that you're another bird right with it whether it be a gobbler and a hen You know, it's similar in waterfowl, and that's what kind of got me into it. And I talked to my dad about it. I was, you know, and his knowledge was very limited. Um, He might have gone on maybe one or two duck hunts when he was in his, like, early 20s, maybe even teens. 
and just he never just got the the feel for it and it just really wasn't that big in our area at the time so he kind of just phased out of it and that was the extent of it so yeah i'd consider myself the first generation of of a duck hunter or waterfowl hunter in general in my family um i'd say for myself i'm a third generation so both my grandfather and my dad were really into waterfowl hunting but as my grandfather got older and my dad had me and my sister uh it just was a lot harder to do because we were always going around it was hard to get out and set decoys for everyone. It was just easier to go out and deer hunt. So I went out a couple times with my grandfather and my dad when I was younger. But other than that, we were really big into deer hunting and turkey hunting. But they were big into it like in the 80s when waterfowl kind of started really pumping up. And they never really, I mean, we never really went out just because it was a lot harder with sports and everything. But that kind of like rekindled. A little bit later when I was a little bit older and could do it on my own, but I would, they, I used to go out with them every now and then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Maddox, do you remember, did your dad, did he, did did your grandfather, did he waterfowl hunt as well? My uh, my grandfather was a big uh, deer hunter. Okay. Um, he, he was never, never did much waterfowl. I, I knew, granted, I, I knew my grandfather for a very short period of time, but to my knowledge, he, he was not a big waterfowl hunter. He hunted deer and... Uh, I would say probably my my dad and his friends kind of just took it up just when they when they were growing up, you know. Probably, you know, it was introduced to them through a friend or a family friend and they they got hooked on it. Um they were it was what my dad always tells me is they were one of the first waterfowl hunters, groups of hunters in in kind of our area. Mm-hmm. They used to, you know, back in the day, you know, we had permission for every field around here cuz you'd you'd go knocking on doors say, "Hey, you know, I'd like to a uh, goose hunter I'd like to duck hunt and they'd say you want to hunt what you know and it's you know yeah go ahead I don't care so <laughs> now it's been like this this weekend just being at like this duck camp like this the whole cabin's filled with just old duck hunting stuff old decoys uh man like uh right old regs and like all sorts of different things and it's like you just get your mind going about like what it used to be like and then all the um you brought your layout blind that you use t- telling the story about that oh yeah the, the the layout blind that was handed down to me from from my dad it, uh, i i don't know the brand the whatever tags were on it or labels were on it or long we we're thinking avery off. potentially the the camo pattern reminds me of like the avery bags mm-hmm. or like the old school avery camo um but that thing i mean it's it's built like a tank it's it's not light at all. It uh, it doesn't fold up real tiny like the like some of the newer ones, but it um it it it's hold up held up through the years and uh from what from what I can tell or from what I've been told it's it's 20 plus years old and still kills geese. We saw Crazy. that saw that earlier this evening. It still That's works right. just fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's just fun to yeah, just think back what it used what it used to be and yeah, what it is now and to what where it's going. I yeah. guess. Yeah, um but uh no this week this weekend's been a lot of fun too. It's uh this this trip got put together very last minute. It was one of those uh if you guys follow Campus Water and kind of just follow us and listen to the podcast, you've heard numerous times where these trips come down to the last wire, last minute. Um and this one exactly the same where um I put it on myself. I I feel like where I I know that students don't really know if they're hunting a weekend until probably that Wednesday beforehand. And that's kind of when I'm like, okay, I got to start figuring out where I'm going to be hunting this weekend, who find a group of students. Um, I put a story out and reached out to some of the people that I knew reached out to Maddox. And he mentioned that they were planning on coming out here. And um, here we are last minute. You guys threw things together and had a good, uh, what is it? Saturday evening right now. It's had a good first day. Yeah. Last minute's all right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Definitely, yeah. definitely had some uh, some uh, changes in the plans and everything. You know, last minute curveballs on top of other yeah. last minute items. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it was a roller coaster of emotions this yes. whole this whole weekend, <laughs> whole week leading exactly. up, and then into the weekend. It was oh, we got permission on this field. No, we don't have it anymore. Oh, we got this. No, we don't. Mm-hmm. That cold front moving through it, it kicked out a lot of our uh, early ducks, a lot of our wood ducks and our teal and. We're waiting on a lot of big ducks to show up right now, a lot of our migrating mallard populations and other puddle ducks, and it's just, you know, scouting our butts off, just trying to 
trying to piece something together and I, I I've been very happy about it so far. I think these guys would agree. It's it's we're we're coming together, we're making it work and it's 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 been paying off. Yeah, definitely definitely this afternoon wasn't, you know, necessarily like the best the greatest hunt we could have had, but it was definitely a positive outlook on like what's around. You know, we've yeah. got everything around, so they're starting to move in. You know, it's just a matter of getting on them and getting it done and that's definitely doable. We show we could do it to a degree to this afternoon. Mm-hmm. So, you know, coming in uh, to you, before coming to New York, you always hear about kind of just the um, the Canada population of, of geese, and like you hear about the early season and stuff, all the the locals, uh, resident birds, but then just I guess just numbers in general, how how many Canadas are here? Uh, I've kind of it can confirm that this weekend. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Tonight we got a pretty good image of what we have. And in the video, you'll probably see all the flocks coming in and working them. But a couple of them, they went to different fields every near, here and there. And when we were actually cleaning up decoys after light passed 10, 20 minutes, but it was still the way the lakes are, it's really flat. So you get a lot of late light, but it's not legal. But the, all the geese would get up in just one massive horde, and the sky just almost turned black when deafening when they were lifting off. Right. I say we. I mean, we probably saw a couple thousand. I'd, I'd say between one and two thousand Canada's today in the air, just mm-hmm. flying us. We, we probably worked almost a thousand birds yeah, today no, they were, alone. And they were, yeah, that's. And that, I give these guys credits because even like talking to you guys and, and just listening. Um, you guys haven't hunted like a ton of fields before. This is you? my first ever crazy Canada hunt. Okay. Early season we went out. We kind of got screwed over with some things and here and there, but we never had birds work us. It was more they fly over low and then they'd keep flying to other fields. Being early season Canada's, they do what they want, all that. But yeah, this was the first like real taste of hardcore waterfowl field in your face Mm -hmm. minutes on minutes of just circling and just hundreds of eyes watching you right Mm -hmm. yeah and this this evening was not an easy hunt because we had very to no wind (laughs) little to no wind it was it was was hard hard to set up on those birds for sure trying to get them to work how we wanted them to we we kind of set them up perfectly to just be able to circle and circle and And circle they kept circling and more and more came in and yeah um no i give you guys credit for um just being patient, I think that was the best thing, and uh, didn't take a shot that you that you ne- that you wouldn't um, necessarily like. Just have to take have to take just a, a shot that you, yeah those questionable shots. You you were waiting for that right moment, and, and if you didn't get a shot, then you didn't take it. So um, you were patient, and you all did good. Yeah, so. I agree with that. I think every every shot we took today, where birds were fully committed, they were feet down over the decoys. It was. It was great, and I, I think it's it, it was definitely cool to see because I've hunted quite a few fields in my time, but getting Louie out there and having having those couple flocks of ducks work too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, they, and the they, pigeons, and, yeah. and the pigeons, <laughs> and the pigeons, pigeons. pigeons. greasy pigeon feet. <laughs> um, but like here in Louie, you know, I'm I'm talking about hunting the fields up here, whatever. I'm like, yeah, you know, I've got my my field mallards and my mojo, whatever. And he's like, oh, field mallards don't exist. I'm like, what are you talking <laughs> about? They don't exist. I've shot tons of mallards in fields. And he's like. He's like, come to the Finger Lakes, they don't exist. I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll see about that. So, you know, we, we shoot a bunch of our geese today, and light starts getting low, and wouldn't you know it, we had 50 to 75 field We mileage. had more than that. Yeah. I mean, the one flock, we had four, like, three, four flocks of at least 30 or 40. Yeah, I mean, we had quite a few ducks, and they, um, again, trying to play the wind and um, working those birds and not having the greatest setup, the greatest hide. Um, we, we worked those birds and worked them and worked them for – 15 20 yeah. 25 minutes just circling and we, we had past shots that we could have taken but nothing you know nothing perfect nothing good enough where i felt like i could confidently call a shot for that but even even just being so it was it was really yeah. cool it was fun just laying there just them right yeah. above us yeah. the whole time and just seeing them like they they wanted in but it's like yeah they, it just wasn't there was set something up. just they didn't want it right. enough that it was like but the nice thing is, though, tomorrow morning we're going to go to a close field where hopefully we can figure out the kink we were missing today and be able to put the hammer down on them. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, so this so podcast will be out first. The The hunt that we just mentioned, will, the video will be out in a couple of days. And then we got we just did a 
an awesome pigeon pigeon uh what is it? Pigeon uh, popper. Pigeon, pigeon, poppers. Pigeon, poppers. pigeon poppers recipe. I'll be out next week, and then tomorrow's hunt will be out next week, Thursday. So be on the lookout for that. And and literally, you guys are listening to this podcast. I don't know when you're when you're listening to it, but if you're listening listening to it the day it came out, like this hunt just happened this last weekend. So just yeah, to give you a little context of date and how fast we're, our turnaround time is yeah. here at Kemp's <laughs> Waterfall. <Yeah. laughs> we don't mess around. Try to get you live updates throughout yeah, the season. It's pretty great. Um, we're we're cramming a, cramming <laughs> yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of hunting and a lot of time into a short amount of time, and it's fun. It's mm-hmm. a, it's you know getting up and going and just going going going. It's really cool and to hear that all of this is going to be published and edited in the next couple of days is really yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah, and you guys get to look back at it like regardless of how many views or listens or, or what whatever it gets how many people like you, you guys will always have this for you guys to look back on yeah I mean, i'm, I'm gonna, gonna watch it family. at least 100 yeah, times exactly. myself i'm just saying <laughs> so you'll have some good hunting photos and you'll have yeah, that definitely. for memories so that's always that's the best part of my job is having these th- this these weekends documented for you guys so and for, not just you guys for myself as well so for all of us so i don't i don't necessarily want to go on a tangent but a, a little interesting thing is like not necessarily the numbers we saw today, but like the flock style of like big like big flocks of birds coming in is kind of what my area is early season. Um, our area has a ton of residential geese in it, and they will pick a field. Um, usually, it's so we do a lot of corn and soybean in our area. That's like ninety nine percent everything. But every once in a while, someone will do some, like, side crop, like a small field of it or something. It'll get cut early. And when that happens, you get, like, I've seen, like, for around us, like, a 300-bird feed is a, a sweet feed. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll just come in big flocks. And then you also get the family groups of, you know, early season. But uh, late season, late season's a lot different in my area. than It's, it's interesting because I'm only about a, probably an hour and 32 hours uh, east of here and it's just completely different like we don't really see a whole ton of the migration late season you might see one or two flocks uh in the sky and you're you're basically running traffic on mm-hmm. migration so it's in, it's interesting you know obviously topography changes greatly from Cobalt skill area to here so um it, it's, it's definitely mind-blowing to be able to see like a flock a couple miles away here like by the time, uh, typically you'll hear geese a lot, like a long time before you see them in my area. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, there's a major change with the waterfowl scene across New York as in many states. Because you go from western New York, which is extremely flat in comparison, where you can see tens to twenties of miles, depending on where you are. Then you go more east, you get into the mountainous areas. So the Adirondack Mountains and the Catskills, it's river hunting and ponds that hopefully don't freeze. And then as you go north, you get the St. Lawrence River. And then we also have Long Island with sea ducks. hunting the Sound and the Sea Ducks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a little, it's a probably like New York, honestly, has a little bit of everything in it. Like if you, um, it's a great state if you're ever thinking about starting waterfowl to just like if you want to shoot mallards and you want to shoot woodies and you want to shoot you know little ducks teals maybe or you know black ducks whatever you can find that and then if you want to go and shoot massive flocks of canadas and snows you can go do that if you want to be on this tiny little baby hole and maybe see one or two wood ducks fly by you you go up to the adirondacks and then you want to go shoot sea ducks on the sound you can go and do that too so there's all sorts of things yeah exactly so new york is definitely it's 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 an underrated state right. for waterfowl now granted we don't have generally i mean we do it's just they're not here for a large amount of time like you go out west dakotas and nebraska and stuff you have your your thousands upon thousands of ducks that are constantly hitting fields especially during the later season um, but we do have that. I mean, I've, I've seen that with my own eyes. I've hunted with my own eyes out um, western New York, where I'm from. Uh, being right on Lake Ontario, you get that first push of the migration south from Canada, and you you see those numbers of birds. And it it, it it's crazy to think that people you know just push New York off as you know it's New York. We're mm-hmm. we're we are upstate New York. We're not New York City. When yeah. you think of New York, you think of New York City. You think of Long mm-hmm. Island, Manhattan. Um, and even that is completely misunderstood. I was just, I just visited Long Island for the first time 
a few weeks ago. One of our buddies from college uh, lives down there, and he invited me out there to go deer hunting. And if you don't know, Long Island has a massive problem with uh, white-tailed deer overpopulation. So it's, I mean, it's there's a lot of residential down there. We were, we were hunting out in the uh, the North Fork, so we were almost on the very tip, uh, eastern tip of Long Island. Um, and there are just white-tailed deer everywhere. We literally got off the ferry from Connecticut. We, we didn't we didn't go through the city. I've still never seen New York City. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we took the ferry from Connecticut down to the North Fork, and just on the drive to my buddy's house, we saw probably 130, 140-inch whitetail eating off of an apple tree in someone's front yard 10 yards off the road. <laughs> and it was accompanied by about 30 other deer. And um, it's just it's crazy to think that people push off New York as just being – you know, not a great hunting destination mm-hmm. because I think uh, even you, Derek, can probably attest to that. We, we've got birds, we've got a beautiful landscape, mm-hmm. we've got plenty of agriculture. It's high variety of birds too. Yeah, Montezuma. Yeah. No, the uh, you can go. Oh, so the first time I was, I came to New York was uh, two years ago. Visited um, hunted with students from St. Lawrence University. Yep. And we're yeah, that's a little bit northern. A little bit more, than, but still considered upstate or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Anything um, over New York City, we consider upstate. And then right. if you ask anybody above, like yeah, there's another area that's just yeah, upstate, like I-90, very small. Like I ninety. If like you told them that we were claiming upstate, right. they want to be happy about it. <laughs> but uh, no, coming coming to like the New York is, it's kind of like coming back, going back home to like Minnesota. It reminds me so much of Minnesota, the, uh, the people, the, the area, the agriculture, everything. It's very similar, um, in a way. So it's, 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 I enjoy coming up to, up to this area. Yeah. But we just got a really good variety of ducks. Like with dab, you can find about every species of dabbler, uh, sea ducks on the sound. And then even sea ducks inland, uh, a year ago, we killed a scooter or a scoter over on the, on one of the Finger Lakes in the middle of the inland areas, must have got lost somewhere. And then along with that, you get snows, almost every species of diving duck too. And we're fortunate enough here in the Finger Lakes to have uh, Montezuma Wildlife Refuge and mm-hmm. Maddox has Iroquois Wildlife Refuge over by him. So that takes in thousands of birds. Like you'll be driving down the, so Montezuma is split by, uh, it's called Route 90, it's the throughway. And when you if you drive down at like dusk or early in the morning, you'll just see thousands of birds just going from puddle to puddle there. And it's insane to see that different, like, amount of birds and just sitting there because they can't get hunted. We are, like, geographically, I'd say, we are pretty lucky to have the the landscape that we do. We have a lot of open water. We have a lot of big water, the Finger Lakes and the Great Lakes being in the area. And then being so far north and right on the Canadian border, we do get – once once the weather turns and it starts to get colder, we do have a really good migration in cool. a lot of parts of New York. Um, yeah, we're lo- we're lucky to not see ducks that have been uh you know shot at their right. entire migration. <laughs> yeah. So it definitely you know you see ducks acting like they would in their natural habitat rather than being so shy of anything that is just not absolutely perfect mm-hmm. uh, that they just fly away. Um, and then we also get the advantage of you know killing ducks that haven't necessarily you know they've just staged they're nice and full they're getting fat they're ready for their migration so it definitely leads to some some nice you know meat on the ducks and everything to that degree very nice i want to pivot a little bit talking a lot in new york uh learned a lot as well (laughs) about new york so you guys are students at coble skill uh what years are you again uh, me and Max are sophomores, and I'm a freshman. And a freshman. Yep. And how I can't remember if you guys brought this up. How did you guys all meet? Did you guys did you know one another before Copus Uh No. So me and Maddox met last year through Ducks Unlimited. We all we just went to the club meetings because we were both interested in waterfall. Both we were the only two freshmen, were we? Just about there. Yeah. There was not a whole lot in our class. Yeah. Yeah, because we're still the only real active. T- yes, yeah, so we were the only really active two that were like into Ducks Unlimited, so we kind of hit it off, and we have very similar interests. So, I didn't waterfall hunt at all our freshman year just because we can't have guns on campus. So it was hard to just travel two and a half hours, be comfortable with it in the car, cleaning it without it rusting with weather. So I didn't hunt, but we turkey hunted together, and then we hit it off. Went to third term together over the summer with a couple other 
other officers from our chapter. And then we met Ethan this year because he joined Ducks Unlimited. Uh, one of my buddies from high school is also friends with him because he went to Cobalt Skill too. Mm-hmm. So just like mutual connections and pretty much DU too. Yeah, DU definitely played a large part, I would just feel. It, gotta it, bring everyone together. Yeah. yeah. Everyone that all like minded people, you know, we have that meeting every Thursday and it kind of puts you all in the same room to. You and know. especially when everyone wants to go hunting. And like for a lot of us, it's a new area. We don't know, like, especially for me at least, completely different topography. I'm used to just going out, sitting on the lake and shooting ducks. Now there's no water. It's like rivers and then fields and then puddles. So it's a lot different. So it's nice to like be able to bounce off people like upperclassmen that have hunted it before, people from the area, and then also just get people out so you can still enjoy the drive we all have for waterfowl. Mm-hmm. Nice. And you guys just recently had your DU banquet, right? Thursday, Thursday night. night. Thursday yep. night. So, <laughs> so it's kind of busy week. I you didn't even bring that up when I when I messaged you about no, when I was honest, coming up here. It was it was such an afterthought. I was so <laughs> I was so excited to hear back from you that I I literally I ran down the stairs. Louie and I live together on campus. We live in a, a town home with uh, four other people. And I was I was up in my room and I was just scrolling on Instagram and I, I saw the the direct message you sent me and I I ran downstairs and I was like Louie. <laughs> he's coming i was like this is the weekend this is it and so we, we 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 called everyone we knew we were like all right we gotta find more people to hunt we gotta figure out where we're going i i messaged you back as soon as i saw it and i was like all right we're we're doing this and then we got everything kind of set up and then we were like we have our banquet like tomorrow oh, like man. it's it's here because like as soon as you got the text like for the next like two hours it was like Scr- all right scrambling luckily yeah. one of my buddies that i went to high school with he uh, goes to college in Florida, but he's like, can I come up and duck hunt this week? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be home. Like, I'll make sure of it. I'm like, go after the banquet, work out perfectly. Then you text us like, it's perfect. He's already here, so we can hunt. Us too. Let's find another cold skill person in the club. And it, we got really lucky. And then it was like Wednesday and Thursday, we were looking at the weather for here. Perfect duck weather, for especially for here. Windy, rainy. Thursday comes around, go to the banquet, worry about that. Friday, weather just completely lets. Friday was windier than heck, and then Saturday, and then weather for Saturday, dead calm all day. <laughs> right. Sunday at least was supposed to be rainy. Then this morning we looked. Sunday's also calm, but a little bit more of a wind. So. But yeah, our banquet we didn't even think about it in the moment. <laughs> if you would have probably told me about it, and I, I wish I would looked at the the Instagram, your guys' Instagram page, and saw it. Um, but I probably would have honestly probably flown up a day early, kind of flown up to get go to that. It would it, that, at that least tried to cool. see if see if that would have been yeah, a possibility. It went, it went Dang very it. smoothly. Oops. Like it was. Yeah, we uh, we did a little bit. So this was our ninth annual outdoorsman night out. Nice. Yeah, and it went. We did a little bit differently this year. So in years past, we just do raffles. We do like a Yeti cooler wrap, two Yeti cooler raffles, gun of the year, sometimes banner blitz raffles throughout the night. And then this year we threw in a silent auction with it, and then we did one live auction piece. So it was cool just to get into it. And then, you know, last year with me and Maddox, we were both freshmen. Like, and the way our banquet's set up, like in the fall, you kind of get in there as a freshman, not knowing. Personally, with me, I never had DU. I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Colbus. I'm like, they got a DU. I'm going to join it there. Join it. They're like, all right, so we got this thing, this, this, this. And it's like, whoa. Like, it was a rocket ship going off in that room when you <laughs> walk in and they're already like, all right, this is what we're ordering. This is what's going where we need everyone here and here. So like this year is a lot different being like more involved in it as officers of the club to actually see the behind the scenes logistics of it. And then helping like create the banquet to run smoothly and not just being someone that shows up to hand out tickets. Right. I'll, I'll add on to that just a, just a little bit. Um, working alongside our, our regional director, for the Cobalt Skill Region 2 for Ducks Unlimited, uh, you really got to see kind of everything, the, all the work that he puts in for us and all all the all the items that he got for us, all the connections that he made for us to help us uh, collect donations, uh, get discounts for items, um, all uh, basically all the different uh, webs and channels that he put out there for us. And mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's really cool to be a part of it, how we are now being officers of that club. We, we kind of ran the show Thursday night. I'd say as Louie and I and our president and the other officers, um, we, we really kept it running smoothly. We kept that, that boat sailing smoothly. Nice. Nice. 
I got a question for you. Um, so you kind of met this question stemmed from you kind of talking about the transition you went from uh, freshman year to sophomore year where um, it was kind of you're just trying to, I don't know, you just joined and you kind of got a taste of what it was like and it was really hard to kind of grasp what was going on. And then this year you kind of, yeah, took control of that. I kind of felt that same when involved with DU chapters um, at South Dakota State um, and just um, in a community chapter that I was involved with where you go to a meeting and it's like you sit down for the first time or first few times and it's like, and they're going, they're running through like getting stuff organized for the banquet and stuff. And it's like, they're, they're already like maybe five meetings into it and into the, and a bunch of stuff's going on and you're just sitting there like everything's going over your head. You have no idea what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Like, how does someone like that have, that has no maybe maybe that felt fe- feels the same way that I did maybe try to get more I guess caught up in that same year rather than waiting maybe like the next year where they're start they're starting the planning for that banquet from from ground zero. Um. So the only thing I really could say for that would be, especially for us, talk to the officers or upperclassmen that have experienced it before. Because if you just sit there, you're involved. You're involved in it, but you're not really involved with it. You're just kind of riding with it, seeing where it goes, and you might drop it or leave it depending on how it goes. But if you can like actually get in like conversation with people that have done it before, like they point you in the right direction, help you get orientated with what you have to do, and then it also like helps you understand it more. So like, as soon as there are mangoes over last year, it was like, okay, that's kind of how it goes. And then we do our officer elections in the end of the fall semester. So that way, in when we come back in the next fall, it's like we're already planned for our banquet pretty much. So like as soon as we got elected, like we were all already like thinking idea this, idea that. And then went to a def- couple conferences like third term and the New York State Conference and we're hearing different ideas, talking to different chapters. And we're just like shooting off like this, this, this. So like that kind of helped us get a step up and then everyone comes back both freshmen and people that weren't really involved or getting into it and it's like we're already firing on our all four cylinders and they're just getting started right i i can kind of give the the freshman outlook or the aspect of it so i was the same boat when i first went to the du meetings you know we were already talking about ticket sales and like what we we're gonna do everything like that. and i was a little lost and i went to a banquet um i helped set up for it and everything this this past Thursday, and to put it simply, like it sounds confusing on paper, but when you really see it out in front of you, it makes complete sense. You know, it's it it's not as complicated as it sounds. It's um, you know, especially at Cobble School, we have a lot of people that want to come to these banquets. They want to participate. They want to support us, and um, it's you know, I definitely recommend just kind of taking that first year to just kind of get it down, see what it's like. And then after that, you know, it'll look confusing on paper. You're going to be talking to all these different donors. You're going to be talking about, okay, we need this, this, and this. We need, we want this many ticket sales. You know, if you can take tickets, please do so. Please sell them, whatever, whatever. And, but when it comes down to it, um, once you see it like in person and in front of your eyes, you're like, the papers start to make sense. The, the the statements and the discussions at the meetings tend to start to click in your mind and you kind of see where, where it helped and, you know, what it did. And I definitely think, like, after this banquet, it's not as complicated as it seems at all. Yeah, like, another point to that is um, something I know, like, I tried to do as an officer this year because I was more lost than he probably was when I joined – was to try to, like, help out the freshmen and, like, new people by, like, kind of explaining it to them. Like, they're not just joining DU. They're joining DU, and then on top of that, we're doing all of this, and this is, like, what it kind of does. Just, like, cue them into it more and get them more, like, acclimated to, like, the scenarios that's going to go on, like, later in the semester. Do you guys do anything else? So, like, now, say, like, the banquet's all done now. Like, what do you guys do now? So... This next week, we're just kind of taking it low and just kind of letting everyone cool off. And then I think we're pretty much done for the fall semester, most likely. 
and then we might do some other another event in spring and then we have a couple like raffles coming up too do you want to talk about duck banding that yeah oh yeah i mean i could touch on that a little bit um so as as a, a small club uh it's difficult to really put together a lot of um a lot of outings like a lot of banquets a lot of um events mm -hmm. really um because once once we kind of get our our core population of people that come to like our banquet that's kind of it we can't get a whole lot more popularity we kind of build up to that every year and that's our big our big item and um ha having a, a smaller amount of members than a lot of other clubs too like we we learned a third term a lot of the um like southern clubs like lsu and uh auburn like their their clubs consist of like a hundred hundred plus members at some points in the year we see on a good day 25 30 people show up to our meetings and that's on a, a really good day um so it's it's difficult to have really more than one uh event and so we're we're just going to kind of take it low we're recovering from all the stress we've been through the past uh you know six seven weeks from leading up to our event and then we'll have um we do a mystery yeti raffle which is kind of our uh, springtime event is generally when we do it um but we're also looking into expanding just a little bit now that our our club is um kind of picking up a little more speed than we ever have in the past we're we're, we're starting to do a lot better just this past year we earned the uh bronze award bronze all-american award bronze all-american award at third term because we uh we reached our goal of over i think it was over twenty five thousand dollars in yep. donations our club received and uh, i'd say that's pretty good for a small club um we did and it considering we only have one event we well if you think you got 25 members that's thousand dollars per person that's involved with the chapter yeah so i i so. i I mean, I, I was very proud of our club and all of our members for, for awesome. achieving that. Um, so, yeah, we're, we definitely have a lot of ideas for the future, um, more events, more ways to raise money for Ducks Unlimited. Um, what, what Ethan was talking about, um, one of the things that our club does is uh, duck banding. So through a couple of our professors, um, one of our club advisors, uh, Dr. Lacido, along with um, our main club advisor, uh, Eric Struning, we we do a duck banding program so i believe we started well i mean the whole process started over the summer we did a pre-baiting we have a, a, a private marsh permission where we're allowed to go out there and we're allowed to do duck banding um it, it's it's a lot of it takes a lot of time i i was one of the banding leaders this year is what we call them we we had two of them and uh basically it was mine and my my peers um task to kind of maintain these duck traps on this wetland so Every day they were checked to make sure that everything was still intact. Um, we just had these walk-in funnel traps out in this wetland. We had five of them. Um, we, they were constantly being freshened up on bait. Uh, we had a lot of beaver damage we'd have to repair constantly. I'd say uh, a couple of the weeks beginning of the semester, I probably put in 20 hours a week just maintaining these duck traps and, <laughs> and doing that. And then we'll have a, a banding night about twice a week we'll go out there. And we'll actually shut the traps and we'll catch um, mainly wood ducks. Uh, we'll band them. Um, it's a whole whole big process. It's it's really, really cool because um, you actually get to be a part of the banding process. And you learn about um, duck habits and uh, aging and determining gender on waterfowl. Um, and this year we actually reached a, a school record for our number of ducks banded in the fall semester. We banded 95 wood ducks as Jeez. as a club this semester, um, and so it's it's really cool to see now because we'll share with our club the banding data that's received from uh, Hunter Harvest and mm -hmm. you know what's reported, because um, all of that'll go back to um, our one advisor and he'll share all that information with us and we'll say okay we put the band on this bird at this time in this location, it was a you know a hen wood duck a hatch year it was an H Y hen wood duck. And it was shot, you know, two months later in North Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's cool to see we can, we can kind of put pins together and connect the dots and we can kind of, uh, make our own migration map and see, see how the birds are acting, acting locally. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet to, yeah, have that right there at, at Cobble School where you're uh, working with a professor there. Yeah. Another thing is I like, obviously like Maddox was talking about like down South, they get a lot of like, you know. Maybe someone who isn't really involved with DU, but like 
all a lot of these guys are big waterfowl hunters. They'll come out for that banquet. They'll have a ton of people. We we had a good amount of people. Um, but we like a lot of our donors are people very involved, and like everybody who goes there, are like, I personally think they're some of the best donors. Like they love what they're doing. You know, um, it's not just blowing money for fun for them. It's they want to see that money put towards DU and put towards our chapter and everything like that. And uh, you know, without like without them, like that bronze the all bronze all American award wouldn't have been achievable. I wasn't there for that. I believe we received it for last year's banquet, correct? Uh yeah, the twenty was it just twenty twenty two or was it twenty two twenty three school year? Twenty two twenty three technically. That's what I thought. But we only have mm-hmm. one event a year, so it's yeah. It's more funneled. For yes. so for the amount of people <clears throat> that were, were there, at least from what I saw this past Thursday, to achieve that twenty five thousand dollars, um, is pretty incredible. It means that these guys are lo- like love waterfowl. They love the commitment to the sport and uh, preserving wetland habitat. So, you know, without them, we wouldn't really have that any chance of that being achieved at all. So, in the intro, I mentioned that we were going to talk about R3. Um, do you guys know what R3 th- Well, I kind of said it, but do you guys know what R3 is? Not really, no. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> have you ever heard of R3? Um... Maybe once or twice. Yes. One of our passing. buddies has a hat on of R3, and we've always <laughs> yeah. seen it last week. Oh, what's R3? What's R3? R3 stands for Recruit, Retain, and Reactivating out, Outdoors Men and Women. Uh, but it's an industry initiative, um, industry-wide, essentially, where outdoorsmen are just supporting one another in terms of recruiting new, new hunters and uh, recreationalists. Uh, recruiting, retaining uh, the current people that are using the outdoors, um, and reactivating people who have were once uh, outdoors men uh, that maybe just had a point in life where they like just didn't have an opportunity maybe to go, and then now trying to reactivate them to get them back into it. And so where actually Campus Waterfall comes into play in this, and, and it's super the college demographic when where R3 plays a role is uh, very critical because R3 is not just the college demographic. It is industry-wide across all demographics, and just everyone's a part of this. But at the college level, it's super um, important because there's opportunities for recruiting, retaining, and reactivating people of this this age and where they're at in life. So... Um, I want to hear your thoughts and maybe any stories of maybe yourselves or uh, people that you might know that maybe has has anyone in the chapter possibly been recruited to go wa- maybe waterfowl hunting for the first time or get introduced to the outdoors for the first time. Um, or maybe kind of like you said, when and, and you and me kind of had the same story, Louie, where like we did a lot of hunting and fishing when we were kids, but then got busy with sports in high school, and then it wasn't really until college or, or later um, where we got back into it. So yeah. to me, that's that's the definition of reactivating. Um, and so stories like that, have have you guys come across those uh, at all at in uh, at Cobble School at, on campus? So um, we could even say yeah, just um, you go ahead. Literally just last weekend, uh, we had a little officer. Uh, hunt that we did actually out uh, near Canandaigua in New York um, and we took a lot of our officers out and the majority of us have all are all pretty seasoned hunters um, but we, we did a little duck hunt and we did a, a little pheasant shoot uh, we, we were on a game farm one of our our club president actually uh, Taryn Burgess there they they have a game farm in Canandaigua um, and they own a lot of private property on the Canandaigua uh, inlet there and so we did a duck hunt and we brought one of our club officers uh, Michaela out there and we actually got her her very first duck ever it was her first time hunting oh, nice. uh, one of her very first times shooting a gun in general and we we were able to successfully get her to harvest a, a wood duck and a nice drake at that um so I think that kind of fits in there a little bit we I know she's definitely kind of got the bug now she's right. she, she was very <laughs> excited about that I know um but that I mean literally just last weekend that's where we were we were out in the Finger Lakes region again and we were we were doing that 
No, it's it's funny how it's like yeah, li- it was like literally it was last weekend, mm-hmm. and it's things like it's things like that where it's like it just happens organically where you don't really think of you don't think of R three you don't you don't think of like trying trying sometimes to just try to take someone out. It's things just come into play organically and 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 by themselves and for a purpose and for a reason, um, and that's kind of where like this demographic is and and to where campus waterfall has always been it's like we haven't really changed our like like we've changed our messaging a little bit just to bring our three a little bit into the light uh just to talk about it in these situations but just having people in a community that are good people wanting to help other people get them and involved in what we love to do share our passions with those types of people that might not have those opportunities that's all that that's all this is Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's all this takes and um and that's like yeah nature is the best teacher Mm -hmm. um in my opinion being out there um just seeing things how they are um being able to self-reflect and uh just learn i guess from one another Mm -hmm. so um what are you guys, any other instances you, you can think of? I actually do also have a story from this season. Um, so opening day of duck season this season, I took out two of my buddies from college. Um, one of the guys, so this was a bur- fo- both of them, their first time ever waterfowl hunting. Um, the one guy had hunted deer and turkeys. Um, he's originally from New Hampshire, so he's done that. And then the other buddy was from Connecticut and... This was the first time he's ever hunted his entire life and the first gun he's ever shot except I think like a 22. And so we went out. Um, originally I wanted to hunt this big swamp that I on some property I own um, or my father owns. I should be honest. He'll probably get on me for that. But uh, <laughs> uh, so um, I was originally going to hunt this big swamp. Uh, I had scouted it. There's birds in it, but it's, you know, they, there's a lot of deep passageways that are hard to get into, and I just wasn't sure. And so I shot down. There's this little woody hole that I had scouted the year previously, and there had been no birds in. But it was like this perfect, you know, between these two big hills, this swamp, like flooded timber, woody hole. And I busted about 10 woodies out of there when I was scouting it, and I was like, all right, we're hunting here tomorrow morning. So we go out. I think it's about two minutes, three minutes into shooting light, and uh, it's still very, very dark. Um, I forgot a headlamp, so I threw out my decoys in the dark, so it was a whole mess there. And we had two two mallards. It was a drake and a hen buzzing, and um, I remember we shot. Um, we ended up killing a, the drake. It turned out to be a band, so the first duck <laughs> of the year it turned out to be a band. And when I got back to the blind, you know, I was shaking. And um, it was interesting because, like, they didn't understand how just how lucky we had gotten with that. Mm-hmm. And But I remember, like, the first thing one of the guys uh, told me was, like, did you hear how their wings sounded when they were flying in? It sounded <laughs> like jets coming in. And it just was, like, a great – like, they're both hooked to it now. I know um, one of the guys went out with – he works at a farm near Cobble Skill. And he was talking with his boss constantly, like – talking about how he went on this hunt and how it was so awesome and his boss invited him to go out with um out onto his farm to hunt some geese and uh he ended up hunting i'm not exactly sure i believe i don't know if it was of the new york chapter of or of the national chapter uh, with the vice president of national wild turkey federation hmm. so it's, it's just interesting you know this that was his second hunt ever in life and uh you know he's already making connections that can last a lifetime right and they're both hooked to it now, which is awesome. So bring them back for the weekends. We can hunt my hometown and even, you know, get on some permission in Cobble Skill and go around there. Yeah, back to the R3, I just completely popped in my head. But uh, my dad has a buddy from high school, and his son, who's 30-ish. But we've hunted with them every year since I can remember up in the Adirondacks at deer camp, doing big woods hunting, shooting and up there you can only shoot bucks, but you are lucky if you even see a deer. Mm. A lot there's not as much as a population, but this last year because I got in the waterfall hunting, and I went like almost every chance I got. My dad's like, "Hey, if you guys want to come down, we'll go out on the beach." And 
So we brought them down. We hunted one day, and they got hooked. The guy's son has went out, bought a shotgun, <laughs> trying to get decoys, and he just got into it. So it's like nice to see that someone else got the same thing I got, and like watching it like again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but all right, we are. How do you guys feel about the podcast? Feel good. Yeah, it's pretty good. good. It's cool. If you got anything yeah. else you want to, <laughs> yeah, I'd talk. We're rolling. Good. Might as well. It's uh, eleven forty-five. It's daylight savings tomorrow, or, or within what the next fifteen, twenty minutes, or 15. yeah. So yeah. we'll have to next get an hour, <laughs> hour or whatever. Well, ha- it's I think it hits at two a.m. is when it. Yeah, hits. but we were talking about this. Like we're not really yeah. losing an hour for when we're going hunting, right? No, because so daylight, daylight savings doesn't really affect hunters because while well, the time may change, the time that it takes for the sun to rise is the, still the same. You're yes. still waking up yep. when the sun rises. Sun, sunrise is sunrise. Yeah. So we we don't we don't gain that extra hour of sleep. So sun don't wait for an hour exactly. horizon for us. So. We don't lose or gain, but next week or any other day we go hunting when it's 11 p.m. It's like oh it gotta be up at three, not five or four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It will. It will. Burn like up tomorrow. until. Midway through tonight, we're like, all right, we got up at like what time was it? Five today? Um, five thirty. No, no, it was five. five. It was five. Yeah, today, today was our five a.m. wake up, and they're like, all right, let's wake up at five or a little earlier because we got to go. Because this morning we just hunted the lakefront or the lake, so we only had to like walk down a couple hundred yards, and then we just took the boat to a point. But tomorrow we got to drive around the lake and go up on uh, near a field we hunted tonight or earlier in the first video. So we're going to have to get up earlier, and then we're like, all right, so like 5, 5.30, pushing out a 4. Breakfast conversation and then we're like, started. Oh, there's daylight savings one time sunrise, and it's like, oh, it's an hour. Like, it was 7.40 today, <laughs> yeah. now it's 6.40 tomorrow, and it's like, ugh. Extra half hour thrown in there so we can dig into that massive apple pie we got staring yeah. at us all week. Yeah. We're going to have apple pie for the breakfast. Oh, apple it's pie so got brought good. Friday night. We didn't touch it Friday. We're going to touch it tonight, but hey, pot roast, mac and cheese. And then poppers on top of that. Pidge poppers. I got baby. some scrambled. I can, I can put scrambled eggs too in the menu for tomorrow oh, yeah. morning. I'm down. Yeah. Oh, I'll eat anything. We're eating good this weekend. <laughs> we are some, eating good. I can't have too much coffee in that blind tomorrow. <laughs> did you bring up? The, did you bring up the mac and cheese and the pot roast? Oh, that's gonna from hurt Bill tomorrow. No, you didn't even bring that all up. We gotta thank Bill for all yeah, this. We do. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. I'm not supposed to call him sir, so thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Really Say sir in together. Spanish. <laughs> Senor? Senor. Yeah, <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I'll never figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, it really came in clutch this weekend, helping us out, letting us use the house. So that way, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Beautiful thanks, piece thanks of to your whole family for yes. letting us use use the property and everything. It's it's great. Makes last minute a little bit more comfortable. It does. Yeah, it yeah. Was, yeah. It hel- it's helped a lot. Yeah. Just yeah. Having a place where we're not just running around or, or sleeping on the dorm floors. I was going to say, it must yeah. be nice having a bed to sleep in. Yeah, you get yeah. your own room. It, it, it is nice. Yeah, you would have enjoyed so. our couch in our townhouse. I've yeah. slept on a lot of couches, slept on a lot of dorms. I'm sure. The floor, in the dorms. Yeah. So. so have I, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, have we, do we ever talk about our, our, our uh, um, little conundrum this morning or what we learned about last night? Did we ever mention that in the video? What did we learn? Yeah, what did we learn? About someone hunting our afternoon feed in the morning. Oh, oh yeah. The, the so permission. another curveball with weather. Well, yeah, so last night, so the farm property was in hunting, and luckily enough for me, it's my girlfriend's father's property. So we do luck out there a little bit. And so we were going to go hunt it. And another friend of mine that's still in high school here, he – he works on the farm and it's more of his permission than ours. So we were going to hunt it with him and we were going to try to do Friday night, but he was, he just picked up a German short herd pointer in Ohio or Indiana. So he was not for tomorrow. And so he's like, all right, tonight we'll work Saturday. So we say, all right, we're going to hunt the field Saturday. Let's call the farm and just double check. Text him. Let me know when you can call. Cause he was working. So I didn't want to bother him. He calls me. He's like, yeah, so there's someone hunting the field below the pond tomorrow where we're going to – because, like, the pond and then just east of the pond, there's the fields where we're hunting. So we were going to hunt there. And then he calls me. He's like, yeah, so you, there's actually people hunting, like, on the other side tomorrow because none of the guys on the farm really goose hunt anymore, which is who they used to do exclusive rights for just because of the way it was. It's a conundrum around here with waterfowl and permission. Mm-hmm. So – Last night I was like, oh, 
we're going to get blown out. <laughs> They're going to shoot up the spot in the morning. No birds are going to come there at night. But then one of our buddies that we hunted with this morning drove over by today, mid-morning, and the guys were on a way different piece than what we thought they were going to be hunting. They did end up shooting. They did shoot birds, but because New York State's limit during yeah, for this region about it. is only three birds per person, so they must have only yeah. been hunting four people because they got 12 apparently. But when he drove by the field that we were playing on sitting in tonight, it was still full with birds. Hmm. So up until like 11 a.m. today, it was field got blown out. <laughs> didn't know what we were doing or anything <laughs> our 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 hopes were dragging on the ground behind yeah, us exactly. i'll tell you that we it was not looking great for this weekend but getting sent that first video from yeah. nolan there seeing 600 plus birds sitting in that cornfield just the caption <laughs> they're still here <laughs> you know it it, br- it brought good. us all right back up and we we were so excited to hunt that field we showed up probably two hours before we needed to be there which mm-hmm. actually worked out Cause thing we did, because as we were, all of our blinds need to get rebrushed in because it's chopped corn. So we were trying to figure out where we were sitting. Where we thought we would sit was a little different from the field edge than what you see from the road. It was, it was trying to figure out where the birds were coming from. We had no wind. We, we had to put out a big spread. We were trying to figure out what pattern we wanted to run. Uh, the the hide was really tough. There's not a whole lot of... Uh, not a whole lot of stuff left on the ground to brush in with, so we had to figure that out. Go riding around looking for brush to brush in the blinds. It, it was a this today was was a cluster <laughs> for sure. But luckily we got there early, got everything brushed in. We took all the trucks, parked them in a laneway, and then as we're walking back, we hear honks coming over the trees. We're like, "What is going on?" And it was you and Ethan just yeah. sitting in the yeah. blinds because all of us had our vehicles over there. All the guns, I think, were still in front yeah, of the blinds, like, not even, even loaded in the one, cases yeah. and everything. We're like, oh, boy. And we just watch them come right over the trees and cup right in. Yeah, on they, they were like, locked up over yeah. top of the treetops, yeah. just coming right in there. They, and they then we, we're like, all right, we'll sit back. Maybe somehow we got a gun out and loaded just to take his limit right here. But that, that ended up not happening. And we look out and we see everybody knowing just hightailing it across the field. <laughs> just booking it through that cornfield. <laughs> but. It's a lo- good thing we got there as early as we did because that flock, there was three in it, and then we waited, what, another 45 minutes, 30 minutes? Yeah, it was a while. Not long. We, well, we, this time of year, we were, I mean, we probably saw 100 geese before anything really flew to us just because we were watching migrators fly up high, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah we waited a while, but it was like that first flock, like, oh, my, no way, we just missed this first flock of geese. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But once they started flying, they came and, like, you guys will see in the video, but they come like in probably flocks of 20 or 30, a couple bigger ones, smaller ones here and there. But then they all just would come over us and they just keep dumping in on each other, but they weren't landing. It was weird. They were just kind of circling. They'd cup up a little bit, keep fluttering. But we had that three or four, t- two or three times today. What's that? The groups would just circle us. More than two or three times. Oh, it was the entire evening. It was, it was, yeah. it was what we had. We, I mean, we, we had... Like flocks it. work us for like a half an hour just yeah. circling and circling and circling and then you know they'd they'd start to fly away a little bit and then the, you know we draw them right back in we our calling and our decoy spread was good enough and they'd circle they just did not want to fully commit and i think if we had a little bit of wind it might have enticed them a little bit more or yeah they would have gone down a little a little quicker i, I, yeah. I think so and it was the same thing with the ducks this evening we we didn't take any shot at any ducks just because the shots weren't you know weren't what we wanted them to be they, we, we worked ducks for a while, and we saw a lot of ducks, more than we thought we were going to. I mean, previously scouting that field, we said, okay, there's about a dozen mallards, you know, hitting it in the evening. And we saw about ten times that today. I think the first flock was a dozen, and then. And there's about five more. <laughs> there's about, f- not even five, there's like two or three, but they were like two to three dozen apiece. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were, uh, they were traveling in big groups. And the way we were sitting there, the ducks were coming behind us. So you, I don't know if you can see in the video the way the camera was, but they come behind us, and you just hear <laughs> right over top of you, and the wings just go. <laughs> like, All right, they're on top. The sound effects are on point. This yeah, that was, that was good, actually. I trick That's everyone. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we get some kink, kinks worked out by tomorrow morning. And Definitely. Uh, yeah, tomorrow, though, it's a little bit easier because tonight a lot of it was – we didn't shoot as much as we could have. We could have definitely shot a lot more. Wouldn't have been as productive shooting. I think it would have been a lot more singles and doubles dropped. But I think it was for the better as tomorrow 
the field it's the same birds most likely just different field maybe more new ones but i think not blowing them out helps us a lot tomorrow because tomorrow would right. be a complete wash without we didn't, it we didn't educate any birds yeah no that's i just thought thought of that where it's like we never really shot Indian. we shot at one flock yeah just one flock and there was one and then singles one flock and singles yeah. and doubles yeah because yeah. mm-hmm. what happens is we'd have them land We'd have like the flock land. would fly yeah. off, or the single, yeah, the flock would fly off, and the yeah. single would kind of be like, all right, yeah, try to get them off the ground. He'd yeah. get up. We had that. We had them. that one nice flock work us that we picked a bunch out of, and then mm-hmm. it was mainly singles and doubles that we had work either by themselves or we'd draw them out of flocks. And yeah. Then once we couldn't work the rest of the birds, we'd bump them up and shoot those singles and doubles. We got some small geese today, even for late season. There's a couple. Well, we were breasting a couple of those out. There's uh they're definitely fatty. There's there's some mm-hmm. birds in there that they're they're putting on the putting on the weight for late season. Even body size there is nothing to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Young geese. But we we killed one or two that were oh, yeah, there's some honkers in yeah, there. Yeah, definitely some some big honkers, yeah. so. Even my first like being from out of state like looking at them they're like these are a lot smaller than I've seen lately or like from other places. Like I, we were shooting them in Michigan and the ones in Michigan were a little bit bigger it seemed like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. No, Those we we have we have big old honkers, but mm-hmm. there's definitely some small geese mixed in here for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, what can you do? Hopefully, we'll get some big ones tomorrow. Yeah, there you definitely. Go. It's a little hard to tell size when they're flying in. Yeah, yeah, they still look big when they're flying. Yeah, in. Exactly. like that that one juvie we got, it was looked like a normal sized goose. When I get up to it, I'm like, it's like the palm of my hand. Yeah, <laughs> like that ruddy duck. Yeah, we got the ruddy duck. <laughs> we did, we that did, was we a, did shoot a ruddy that's duck. A, that's how we're kicking off the first video. Yeah, yeah. a little ruddy action. <laughs> Try to get that guy to fly. Those yeah. things do not get off the water. Well, they go canal system. <laughs> yeah. Well, any any last words, you guys? Thank you. Eh. Like, thank you so yeah, much for coming out. No problem. <laughs> it's been great. It's been so fun. Yeah, that was. It'll be, it'll be a weekend we look back on for oh, 100%. a long time. Yeah, you'll be thinking about those pigeons for a while. The I pigeons. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we've – shoot, I don't know if we've done pigeons in a field like that that did it that bad. That was a <laughs> good, that was a good way to warm up for the hunt. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. definitely. They did it dirty Got today. The blood, that was cool. The blood flowing. It did, especially that single. <laughs> I, I, I can't <laughs> wait to watch that. That's just be in the background. to watch. Uh-huh. I can't wait to wait. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> can't speak anymore. I'm so tired. Be, yeah. Now we got to get some sleep. Yeah. So um, oh, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna close it out uh, here for the podcast. Um, out of SUNY Cobal Scale, out of the Finger Lakes region. Um, appreciate you guys, everyone listening and tuning in. Be be on the lookout for the videos here this week and next week. Um, but we'll see you in the next video in the next podcast where we're not we have an idea this time where we're going to be going next but not 100 percent sure so we'll see you in a couple weeks